Okay, but the real men in black, are, are we talking about humans or a non-human intelligence? So what is the real men in black compared to just government agents being, you know, interrogating people? I think there's enough evidence in the literature to indicate that the, um, the phenomenon may be associated with some cases of what we call men in black. But what are they? Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. All right, you guys, welcome to Weaponized. We had some technological problems. I'm gonna blame that on George Knapp, but we have a great episode with Dr. James Lukatsky, Dr. Colm Kelleher, uh, talking about the UFO programs and their new book, which is Inside the US Government, Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations. So jumping on in with all you all, here we go. Jim Lukatsky, uh, it's so great to have you and Colm here to talk about OSAP. For the benefit of our, of our audience that does not understand uh, the difference between OSAP and ATIP, that your new book, Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations, really draws a distinction. And it's not bashing ATIP. It's not going after uh, Lou Elizondo or, or showing differences. But there were distinct differences between those two programs. Can you outline for our audience, those who are not aware of what each of those acronyms mean, what the difference was? Well, the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Applications Program was uh, basically created between myself and Senator Reid at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was a $22 million program. Uh, it had the capability of going five years. We completed our objectives in two years. Uh, you might say... It was test of various components of a UFO, UAP, paranormal research program. Right from the beginning, it included all aspects of both the UFOs and the paranormal in relationship to, to UFOs. Uh, it was an, a, a contract that was put out on the Internet. It had a quick turnaround because of the funding mechanism. The first year was $10 million. The second year was $12 million. And um, we, uh, we got it out. We had numerous interested parties who wished to bid on the contract, but following the regulations, it first had to go to small businesses. Well, the only small business, we found small businesses that were capable of bidding on it, but they chose not to. Uh, Bob Bigelow's Bass created specifically, and that was so important to DIA, specifically to address our needs in this program. And when I say needs, we used a new method of putting out this request for proposal. We did not tell the contractor, the bidder, what to do. We said, this is what we wanted achieved. How would you do it? And that's how this program was created and had specifically all the right components. Let me, um, let me back up a little bit just for our listeners, people that are listening, and also just for the visual audience here. Um, Dr. Lukatsky, first of all, in December 2017, the world learned that there was a UFO study program and that it was funded for $22 million. They heard that that program was called ATIP, but what you've told us is that, no, you ran the program in the DIA for studying UFOs, and it was called AWSAP, Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program. So you're talking now about a government study, a UFO program, studying all the physics and the nature of UFOs up to date. And so you're kind of coming forward with these books, with Dr. Kelleher and, and George Knapp, and you're laying it out for people. This is what we did. This is how we did it. We don't want it to get messed up. You know, we want to tell you what happened. It's a big deal. 
it's a big deal that you're speaking to us right now as uh, you know, uh, someone from the DIA who studied UFOs. So I guess the question for me, you know, for me, very simple, audience kind of might want to know, is that when that came out in December 2017, and you didn't see, you know, your program named there. I mean, what does that what does that feel like? Are you doing this because you want to clarify the record to the public? It, exactly, and we we stated that clearly in, in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. We want to clarify the record. Now we're giving the details of the record. Now the thing is, is a tip. The name itself, uh, I did not create that name, but it was created for a specific reason, and I don't think that's ever been printed. It was done, yes, in Senator Reid's letter asking for special access program. That's been out in the press for, what, five years now. But where did the need for a different name come from? It came from, which took me by surprise, when I saw the funding, someone in other words, the notification of funding that, yes, DIA was getting this money, it was in a, on a piece of paper that had highly classified programs listed on the rest of the paper, and someone in Congress put secret on the program name and it, its very abbreviated contents that were on that document. I did not want to get us crossways with any security considerations, I wanted a different name. Now, I believe that who we called Axelrod, or perhaps Lou Elizond, or perhaps some of their cohorts, and maybe all of them came up with the name ATIP. That name would have been a great problem for DIA because OSAP routed the money to the Defense Warning Office of DIA period. It had to be that name. So the contract may have been called that too, uh, because that's what we put at the, at the, at the open uh, solicitation that can still be found on the internet. Uh, and, uh, and I've repeated in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, of, you know, a concise uh, uh, amount of material as to what we requested. But that's where the name ATIP came from. ATIP was something that was necessary to be uh, proceeded with on military cases. Lou handled that. I was not privileged because it was mainly spun up as I was getting ready to retire. I will say this, though, that when I left, all of our references were electronically specifically scanned in electronically at DIA. Now, I can't say what happened in the years since I retired in 2016. It could have been that they're purged, but they weren't physical records. So I don't see why there is a problem in people asking for them, except for the fact, and this is why these books are required, most of them were proprietary. Remember, they were monthly reports from the contractor and specialized studies. They had people's names, contractor names, the facilities that were being bought and constructed. Uh, they had security information. They had all of this, and I have already told, I wasn't asked to, uh, 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 have these documents clean for release, but the proprietary information is so much, I said preemptively, I wouldn't take on that job. Uh, it, it, it's just too much. We're doing it in this manner so the public knows what went on in that program within the constraints of security. I hope that answers your question because ATIP was a specialized small program uh, it had access, I'm sure, to funds that I also had access to, but not use on this program, of where we can go out and, uh, uh, let's say, review facilities at DIA. Uh, I, I used them to review uh, uh, missile contractors, in other words, so I could learn the nuts and bolts. But money, I'm sure, was available for ATIP, 
but nowhere near $22 million. In Th- two that's years. really helpful. So George, we're talking about that, like how ATIP kept its legs because it was heroic in a, an attempt to kind of continue it. The fact there was money available wasn't out of the 22 million. And, and we're making that clear. It was misreported mm-hmm. in the New York Times. You know, however, it, it is nice to know that, you know, somehow how they got, you know, any funding to do the work they were doing. Yes, and I was aware of, of some of the programs the uh, the cases that they were looking into, and I can say without going into detail uh, because it's a classified uh, uh, endeavor. I was fascinated by one of their cases because it was a repeat from the '60s. I uh, and there and if you go through our databases, you're going to see cases where people claim, "Wait a minute." I saw the same UFO when I was 20 years younger. And, and those cases kind of fascinate me. How can, how can that be? At least, are we talking about time machines? Well, what are we talking about? But uh, you will find that uh, another fascinating point of our huge database is it would be the equivalent of us going out for a drive in our car. And every car and truck we meet on the road is of a different design. I mean, to me, that's uh, that's an interesting insight because when people make up charts, and we have a nice one of all the configurations of UFOs, uh, and those are ma- main configurations like triangle. There are very many variants of triangles. Uh, it's like. How can this be? I mean, it's like certainly we're doing things exactly the opposite in the auto industry. Every SUV looks like every other SUV. You have to look at the the name badge in order to tell what what brand is that. I like it or I dislike it. But right now I like them all mainly because they all look like in the UFOs, totally the opposite. There's one uh, particular UFO uh, design that gets discussed in the book that you reveal, and if you if you blink, you'll miss it. But it's mm-hmm. it's maybe the most controversial and and important piece of information that this book conveys. You say something at the beginning of chapter nine about a craft uh, of unknown origin that our government access finally accessed the inside. Can you? Uh, share with us what's in the book, and is there anything else you can add to that? Well, what's in the book is an exact statement of of the event that occurred uh, in the uh, in let's say in, in a congressional facility. Uh, there was more to it, considerably more to that discussion about what this situation was. We can't go into that because it's, it's and when I, I mean, Colm and I, uh, yes, we know about it. People are interested in it, I'm quite sure, but security has to trump everything else. Um, a lot of things can be said. This was, this book, as was Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, I keep flashing the book, <laughs> uh, basically, was reviewed by the Department of Defense for release and approved the wording that's in it, the wording. If we varied that wording, we'd get back. This was a, a, a seven-month review. This was quick. Uh, DOD on Skinwalkers at the Pentagon took 14 months to review that book. Um, and uh, there was, uh, I agreed with all of the, of the changes on both of these books. I agreed with, except for one, I made the fatal mistake of complimenting the help from a non-DOD uh, uh, organization. And it was, whoa, we can't do that. We've got to align that out. And so that's, that was the only thing that was a straight line out. DOD helped us reword things. Uh, by their security re- regulations. And so you're getting as much as we can say. Jeremy, okay, looks so like hold on, hold on, hold on. So I just, for our audience that's listening, George just dropped an atom bomb because it was dropped in the book. So audience is just listening. I'm going to read you something. Beginning of chapter nine, at the conclusion of a 2011 meeting in the Capitol building with a U.S. senator and an agency undersecretary, Lekatsky, the only one of the book's authors present, 
posed a question, but this is where it gets good. He stated, meaning you, Dr. Lukatsky, that the United States was in possession of a craft of unknown origin and had successfully gained access to its interior. This craft had a streamlined configuration suitable for aerodynamic flight, but no intakes, exhaust, wings, or control surfaces. In fact, it appeared not to have an engine, fuel tanks, or fuel. Now, there's a next part, which I'll read in a minute. But what this is, is you're officially allowed to tell us that the United States government has in its possession a craft of unknown origin, and you were able to access the inside. Is that correct? The wording that you you read is correct. Ah, you're going beyond the wording. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm asking you, did that meeting happen? And is it true? And it's true. Yes. Yes. Okay, you, you're you're telling us, you told us because you were allowed to tell us that our government has a UFO in its possession and has been able to access the inside of it, right? Yes. Well, that's I okay. I, tell you, I was allowed to tell you. Let me show the back of the book. This is. <laughs> I know. I know. But hold up, George. Is, will, you, yes. will you translate, yeah. George? All right. Let's, is, let's try another tack. Um, how do we know it's a craft and not a doorstop? We accessed it. It has no engine. It has no wings. No, no, no fuel. It doesn't. We don't know that it travels. Do we know it's a craft or it's just a, a rock? George, you're you're going into the further discussion that occurred that day. All right. Uh, we can't we can't go there. Uh, but let me tell you, we're going to try to cover that in the future. But it, it's it's delicate. It's it's it makes. It, it why, is it, why is it delicate? Described in here, look primitive. Well, why, why is it delicate? Why is this topic that the United States government has a UFO in its possession and we've been reverse engineering it? You've done admitted right. it. Why is it delicate? The, the details. You, you, I'm old school. I'll use the term. I won't use the term adversary, competitor, as, as, the, as the way we describe We are surrounded, maybe not surrounded, but hopefully uh, not so, by our enemies. And our enemies, you can be sure they're listening to this show right now. You can be sure that they were monitoring ASAP. You can be sure that perhaps they had employees hopefully not in GIA, but in the contractor part, that was, we're giving out information for, I am, I am, I know that. So the thing is, is we can't say anything more than what we've been approved to say. And there's insight to this, but I I wanna, I wanna, I wanna shift it just slightly, but it, it shows my point. Skinwalkers at the Pentagon and Initial Revelations, if I might use the shorter title on this new book, has not what I would call zingers in it, but has some interesting doors that have not been even mentioned. One, why was this program started? Two, why was this program ended? And we've raised this partially and skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Did it end? Uh, Also, we had a chapter in skinwalkers at the Pentagon where we met with a high-level Brazilian official at a meeting, started introducing some of our cohorts, and no one ever asked us, why did you have that meeting? What was so important about that meeting? You know, there's a lot of, 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 of material in there that as Kit Green, Dr. Kit Green, one of our consultants on, on the OSAD program said, read between the lines. That applies both to skinwalkers at the Pentagon and initial revelations. Read between the lines. Now, you may come to the wrong conclusions, and I can tell you on the topics I just read, read you don't have enough information to come to the correct <laughs> answers. Um, okay, so, Tom, so why? Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead, go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead. So, so why? Why did the you, you're asking? One big question people should ask is why was the UFO program started? You, may, maybe you can't tell the full story, but give us a hint. Why was the UFO program started? You said that's important. 
I, I can't do that without without documenting more and getting approval. I mean, can I, I assume? I, I just can't can I, do that. I know, Jeremy, I, you, you and I have met previously several times, and you you want the bottom line, but the bottom line may not. Let me just give you the bottom line may not be what you anticipate. In other words, there may be no bottom line. There may be multiple bottom lines. And uh, we've got a lot of work. You know, if Arrow is going to move forward from this point, they've got a lot more work to do. Why? One of the questions that you posed to us just now was why was the program started? Okay, you can't answer that. But another question you're saying people should ask is why did you do all the, the defense intelligence reference documents? So can you answer that? Why did you do all those defense intelligence reference documents? And the answer is no, I can't answer that because that, 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 that would be an answer that would just uh, floor people. Really? Yes. The, the so real you, answer, and, and by the way, I I I I I don't know whether there's ever been real criticism, but there kind of has by the nature of some of these topics. Uh, we solicited the input for the topics for the 38 papers from uh, from Air Force intelligence, CIA, uh, naval intelligence, and uh, uh, ground intelligence. That. Those are the topics they chose to do, but they were completely legitimate at the time. And by the way, they're pretty close to state of the art right now. Okay, so oh, that's one thing I would like to say about the timeliness of our program or the timelessness. If this program, OSAP, you know, the physics would have been different back in the, in, in the 50s and 60s. Or if this was being done in the 2070s and 80s, what is being covered in this book and what Arrow has been mandated to do by Congress is timeless. In other words, you will be doing the same thing regardless of the time frame. It's just that I'm sure configurations, if, if there are any further configurations there could possibly be of craft, will be available in the future. But, you know, triangles have been seen back into the into the 60s, and I'm sure will be seen into the future. Flying saucers, uh, even craft that look like something from the Jetsons have been seen. You know, the the flying saucer with the big bubble on it with with occupants. That's all the same. In other words, if 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 you look at OSAP and study what's in OSAP and try to answer some of the questions, um, you're 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 not wasting your time. In other words, there 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 a there's a timelessness to it. All right, so we hit some, we hit some technical problems. Which is not uh, strange for us, but we got we got George Knapp here on the phone, and we're just getting uh, you know back down to the point. So George, I was asking you, help me. This guy Lakatsky, he's being a little dodgy as a reporter. I can't nail him down. We're talking about why these, why our government would, or, or why he can't talk more about this. So Jeremy, I don't know. Help me out, George. Jeremy. Well, Jim Kulikowski is the rock of Gibraltar. He's not going to answer that question for you. If he's decided not to a answer it, he's not going to. I was thinking maybe there's another way in. We could go around the corner here. Let's start with Column. <laughs> uh, Column, this book is so much different from Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, and, it, and that was not an, an idle decision. Jim had used the, the phrase earlier in this conversation, nuts and bolts, which uh, you would, will recall you and I were kicking around ideas for a possible title for the for the book and nuts and bolts came up uh, but we didn't think that having the word nuts in a ufo book was a good idea um why you know the the point is that you know we that first skinwalkers at the pentagon had a lot of weird stuff and people think well maybe we made a mistake by including all those stories of strange paranormal type events uh that were highly criticized but in fact that was part of the focus of, of osap 
why uh, why this different approach this time? What distinction is being made here? Well, <clears throat> the critical part of OSAP that we tried to convey in uh, skinwalkers at the Pentagon was that there were two fundamental parallel tracks that OSAP ran on. The first one was the uh, the examination of UFO performance, and you know the UFO performance part was um, get, getting all of the data from eyewitnesses plus deploying sensors into the field in order to gather data on the performance of UFOs. That was track number one, and track number two was what effects do UFOs have on humans. That was a parallel track that from the get-go, OSAP decided unambiguously to run both tracks in parallel. Skinwalkers at the Pentagon focused a lot of its reporting on the second part, which is the effects of UFOs on humans. So that, you know, to summarize that book, we looked at a variety of effects on humans that included um, medical effects, we documented several medical effects, pathological effects, um, physiological effects, you know, the people, people having weird metallic tastes in their mouth, uh, sometimes hair loss and a whole bunch of other things. We documented psychological effects, and then we also documented paranormal effects. So all of these under the rubric of um, um, you know, effects on humans were reported in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. A lot of the pushback that we got from that book was that they, these guys were using taxpayers' money to, to camp out on Skinwalker Ranch and, you know, basically document dogmen, dino beavers, and a whole bunch of other weird stuff. Whereas, in fact, that was only a, a very minor part of the entire OSAP program. So the purpose of the second book is to balance that whole thing out. And so we, we unambiguously focus the reporting on the on initial, you know, initial revelations, the second book, on the nuts and bolts aspects of the UFO phenomenon, which was half of what OSAP was doing. So the purpose of the second book is really to look at um, the UFO performance angle strictly from the from only the performance angle you know things things like you know lift propulsion power generation spatial temporal <clears throat> translation configuration a whole bunch of other aspects of ufo performance that is translatable into theoretical physics <clears throat> eventually into engineering so that's really the Do second point in the, in the only other interview you've given about uh, OSAP, you had said that the DIRDS essentially established a baseline for analysis. It's a baseline of here's what humans are known to be able to do. Here's what we think humans will be able to do in 50 years. And when we look at UFO cases that you do in great detail in this book, uh, it, it is clear that this is technology that we certainly didn't have 50 years ago that we don't have now, and it's not even clear we will have 50 years hence. Um, this is a nuts and bolts uh, UFO book, and it was a nuts and bolts UFO program, correct? Uh, yes. Absolutely correct. Now, the thing is, is there have been, uh, again, on the Internet, because anything can be said on the Internet, it seems, uh, factual or not. Well, one thing that is not factual is... DIA knew what it was getting into in regard to both aspects that uh, uh, Colum uh, just described to you. And let me end my statement right here. We had no choice but to pursue both aspects. Why? I said I ended it. <laughs> Oh, come no, on, that, man. Again, again. Hey, let me tell you, Jeremy, you cannot compete with uh, some of the offers that have been made to me. Uh, I'm joking now, but this is factual. Airplane tickets, uh, uh, speaker presentations, uh, uh, car rentals, uh, hotel rooms, pay for... Uh, you, you just can't compete with all that. I mean... <laughs> 
I can throw in a steak dinner. Oh, man. they've I already done that. Dinner. But you know what? They always look, man, listen, listen. I am, I am way more handsome yes. and way more charming than any but of those I, other I people resisted, asking you to but, spill. You know food. the thing. The thing is that the bottom line is what they all want. And then when I hear the phone of the being clunked on me, is when I say I cannot go beyond what is stated in the book. Now, of course, now there are two books. I can't go beyond that uh, because it. It needs to be. Oh, that's okay. You gave us a great one. You, you told us U.S. government is interested in UFOs, is studying UFOs, has been studying UFOs, is reverse engineering UFOs, okay. has one, and got inside of one. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. That's Okay, so let me ask you about some current events here. I really want to get your opinion on this. So as we know, we're, we're out in, in, in Congress, and you saw, like everybody else, and in fact, I mean, I'll, I'll spill the beans a little bit myself. We were hoping you were going to testify in front of Congress. You didn't, but David Grush did. So I want to ask you your opinion. Here's a guy who says that he was looking at reverse engineering programs, black budget programs, and has provided a whistleblower statement through the Presidential Protection Act, came forward and, and told us all these things that he believes them to be true from his investigations into 40 witnesses. And that has been corroborated by being labeled urgent and credible by our inspector general of intelligence, what David Grush said. So what are your thoughts on David Grush and what he said at that hearing? I don't know, Mr. Grush, uh, never met him. Uh, I was asked almost verbatim the, the same question by a congressional office to me, a telephone conversation. And I said, I don't have a comment. What he's saying is credible. Now, let me do say one thing that I never witnessed. And I don't know if Colm ever witnessed this, but I never saw any what I would consider illegal activities. I saw security procedures that are paramount, but not illegal activities. So, I, I don't concur with that, but it's reasonable what he's saying, and that's what I told. Okay, it's, it's reasonable. It's reasonable that we have UFOs. We're reverse engineering that there are biologicals well, associated we, we with didn't those. We cover biologicals because I, I can't say anything about that. Uh, Why can't you say you don't know? Or uh, I can't say anything about that, Jeremy. <laughs> Okay, no, that's great. That's great. So just another question yes, well, about let that. Let me tell right? you, these Have books you ever... are loaded with questions because someone criticized me, gave me a three rating on Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Well, why do they read this one? They said it's textbook-like. Well, in a sense, they are. They're, they're, they're a learning instrument. And one thing, and I, I don't know if I discussed this with you, Colin, but I was going to put like a textbook, questions in the back of each chapter what did you know what do you think and what do you just for their for, now i wasn't going to give an answer sheet to them but uh uh basically i i think that people really need to delve deeper into the books they have and you know i personally love hard copies but at some point it's going to be hard to flip back and forth you obviously are well doing it well jeremy I always had trouble on an electronic copy of flipping back and forth. I like hard copies. Well, yeah, for sure. And well, listen, however you get the information out, it's great. So let me ask you this, though. The big, the big question with David Grush was they're like, well, he didn't see a UFO. Now, you're in a meeting in the Capitol Hill, and you're telling them, we have a UFO. We've gotten inside of it. Did you see it yourself? Can't answer that. Okay, but if the answer was no, you could answer that, right? Uh, no, that, that comes goes back to something that occurred, uh, a similar question, very similar to your question. It wasn't asked by you, but it was asked to call him. And he said, we found no smoking gun. That is the standard answer we're to give. Is So I could say no, and it still not be the truth. So the thing is, is security is paramount. We follow the rules. And there's a good reason, a, a good reason to follow them. Yeah, you can't tell me that good reason. We've yes. talked about that. You can't give me a reason. You can't give me that good reason. But you're alluding to a really good reason why you can't tell me more about biologics, UFOs, exploitation. You can only say yes. what you said. I, I get that. 
I wish you could give me a good reason because it makes me very suspicious. It makes people like me very suspicious. Like, what is it? Is the reason so dark? Oh, is it I, so I, disturbing? I, I, I see, uh, if you want my opinion on that, I see no darkness at all here. Uh, uh, basically, okay. um, there was some considerable write-ups on the uh, Skinwalker at the Pentagon that our program was stopped due to religious concerns from the far right. Well, if there were, I knew nothing about that. I saw no evidence of that being true. Uh, but people can say whatever they want on the internet, uh, uh, apparently. Um, and that, that was not, that was not, I did not witness any of that. And I think that that's come up in some of these congressional hearings. Let me, let me put it this way. George is saying something. In Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, and, and Column has backed this up in public statements, both of you indicated that you were on the trail of reverse engineering, crash saucer, metamaterials, weird stuff. You went knocking at different places, and the door was slammed in your face. That sounds like you were looking for exactly what we're talking about right here. Is that wrong? Uh, uh, of, of course not. That was part of the program. But I'm saying... The door being slammed in our face wasn't because of uh, of uh, suspected demonic activities within uh, 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 this at all. Uh, in fact, I would say there's evidence uh, that uh, this is something uh, of a nature that, uh, uh, well, I better not say much more. It's, if, if full human capabilities were known to us right now, it is not such something that we need to fear. And I do not, I, I, I just don't believe it. Maybe I'm influenced by my Catholic faith. I don't know, but I'm optimistic. I think everything heads toward good. What do you mean by if full human capabilities were understood? Oh, oh, it would uh, be we nothing don't to fear. Any, any, uh, We'll get into that later at some later point. Uh, but our capabilities, as Colin well knows, he's probably an expert in all of these areas, more so than me, is our capabilities uh, uh, are, 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 uh, have never been uh, fully revealed and uh, we're, we're still learning. We've got a long way to evolve still. George, what were you saying? Well, there are two questions I've asked, and neither one of them were answered. Uh, but the first one was, were the DIRDs established as a baseline? Because that's what has been said before. They were a baseline oh, yes, yes. by which we can measure yeah, that's, the that's unknown correct. craft, they're, they're what their baseline. capabilities are. Yes, they're a baseline. Okay. Well, they're a baseline, but also uh, the purpose of them was to project 40 to 50 years out in the future um, in terms of the best known projections by the sort of the best people at hand. So um, they were a baseline, but they were also projecting mm -hmm. into the future so that there would be an attempt to look at UFO performance and then marry those to the projections, the baseline projections. All right. Well, the second part of the question was, do we not, in fact, report in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon that you guys went knocking on doors asking about these materials? That the materials, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about crash saucer type stuff, that was part of what uh, the, the Bass plant was modified to receive. That was part of the contract, that you were, you were asked to prepare to receive certain materials that you never got, and you went looking for them, and that's when the door was slammed in your face. Colm, am I characterizing that incorrectly? Well, uh, slightly, because um, the people who were uh, moving forward on that were not, um, they were working with the OSAP program, but they weren't part of the OSAP program. And, so, and, right. and remember, well, George. Was, am I incorrect that you guys were looking for stuff? Remember, George, there's yeah, always George is multiple saying. doors. There are always multiple ways of doing things. So just because a door was slammed in our face, uh, is that a, a common expression that we're using? Is that all we can say? Re remember, 
I and Colin became this, are experts at taking higher classification material and describing it at lower classifications. There is no contradiction between the two. It's just that the lower classification isn't complete. And I can tell you there is a lot of material here in both books. It's not complete. And it can't be at this point. Okay. Well, we've, we've, we've dodged the question ah. again. Is are you pursuing this material? Were you trying to find this I, the goods? You know, I, I, there's p part of your question is, is there's material and there's material. Are you talking about material to be investigated? Uh, in other words, pieces falling off flying saucers? Or are you talking about full-blown craft? Yeah. You know, there's a big difference. And, and, and uh, I'm not so sure that I would ever characterize it that we were constructing facilities in order to look at uh, full-blown craft. I mean, again, we're talking about a commitment of money. Uh, Bob Bigelow went over, well over and uh, well and beyond commitment to the contract. I mean, we stopped tracking a DIA, his losses at $1.5 million. Now, is he going to be constructing large facilities? There's a lot of statements that, that have been made on the internet that partially ring true, but ultimately aren't really true. I mean, that, that's a large commitment of money on his part. I mean, and as a contractor, he's responsible for having his supplying the facilities, not the government. Right. But didn't he revert or didn't he retrofit Bigelow Aerospace? I mean, Dr. Kelleher, maybe you could talk about this, but didn't he retrofit Bigelow Aerospace in hopes to gain either some materials or a full craft. You've already told us that we have a full craft that we got inside it, that we've been reverse engineering it within our government. Didn't he want to be part of that and, and get some well, of that material? Part, part of the contract was that, um, you know, DIA uh, wanted a uh, facility security clearance bestowed on some of the buildings associated with uh, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. And so in, in order to be accredited to achieve that, uh, that facility security clearance, a lot of retrofitting was necessary. So, you know, the National Security Agency got involved and all of these audits happened on a very regular basis. So you had to dot the I's and cross the T's. That's, that, that was a part of the requirements of the contract that we, uh, we had to perform. That's a very different thing uh, from, you know, building a, a hangar uh, outside Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in order to receive a craft. I mean, we were mandated by the contract in order to uh, adhere to facility security clearance requirements. Okay, so let me let me just go one last time. So basically, David Grush, what he told us, you both feel that that information is credible, right? Is that what you I do implied? It's it's credible, but I, I, I I'm simply saying he worked with someone that I know and trust um, as uh, the UAP task force uh, leader, and uh, I, I think you should uh, take his statements now whether. Whether, whether or not, if we could just take a moment here, I've observed to Colin something that is, I'm looking at it particularly in regard to UFOs and the, and the paranormal. There are people who have, have written, have talked about things they are absolutely wrong about. But they totally believe it. They, I mean, they. Re you can't call them liars. They totally believe it. Now, how many of those people that David Grush came across are fit in that category? I, I could name a list of them right now, but I won't. I mean, obviously, I, 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 uh, I respect their opinions, but I know what they're saying is false. So. It's a phenomenon now. 
I certainly hope that does not spread across all topics on the internet because we're in big trouble if that's the case. Because that means people are, hmm, is delusional the, cor the correct word? I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but hold, hold on, because we don't have Grush here to, to talk about who yes, he talks with, but he thing. talks about program names. He talked about program names. He talked about holding locations of UFOs, which you've already admitted that we've got them and we've been exploiting them. So he's talking about things that are very tangible and physical, people that worked on UFOs, those programs. So part of the 40 witnesses that came mm -hmm. forward to him are people that actually worked on these legacy UFO programs, which he says exist. We've talked about it. All the four of us have talked about it. We know UFO legacy programs have existed, whether or not you can talk about it or not. We know that they existed. So just to give, you know, kind of looking at what he said, he's saying that there are individuals with direct firsthand experience. It's not opinions they can be wrong or right about. It's whether or not these programs existed. And we have these crafts we've been working on. OK. And I have seen in multiple cases what I would call can only call forged documents. So, OK, so there's another thing we should talk about. So you have, what do you mean by that? There they're have been forged. forged documents. They're, 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 well, what are? they're documents talking about programs uh, that are not legitimate documents. Within intelligence servers, within your industry, there are forged documents inside of our government's, you know, or what are you talking about? Just on the internet? I'm are you talking, talking about, about both? Really? What, how, how could that happen? Forged documents with inside well, you know, our uh, intelligence well, agency server. Uh, they even covered this on an X-Files episode. Every special access program has a counterintelligence officer. That's their job. You know, it's, it's their job. So, you know, you might say, well, wait a minute, Jim and, and Colm are counterintelligence officers. No, we're not. You know, there's no reason to be. But if you're in a program, you have you have that person either assigned to you or you bring them in. And there's a source of forged documents right there. Go Have your, re your listeners and readers go back through the UFO history and you'll see fingers pointing to others that, uh, again, I won't name them, that hey, this is all fabricated. And yeah, like Rick Doty, that's who you're talking about, maybe. Can't say. Oh, hold on, here's George. Here, here's George, he's gonna say something. Go ahead, George. Which, count, which counterintelligence officer wrote this in Skin Markers at the Pentagon on page 152? Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He'll read it. 152. Yeah. Sasha Mover and Jim Bell began knocking on doors beyond DHS to connect with, quote, the keepers of the secrets in at least two other agencies. In these meetings, which took place June, July 2011, Sasha, Jim, and colleagues were treated rudely and harshly. Bell and Mover were repeatedly told no and hell no. This le left them convinced that advanced technology was sequestered under government supervision at aerospace contractor facilities. As a result, the DHS facilities, the Harper De Department of Homeland Security officials, became very hesitant and even fearful of moving forward. Perhaps these two only belatedly realized the unique, game-changing, and earth-shattering nature of the biggest secret ever kept by the United States. Is that counterintelligence stuff, or did you two guys write that? Well, we wrote that, and it was approved by the Pentagon and by DHS. Okay. But the thing is, is that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about plain out and out forged documents that are shown as proof of something, and it's 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 been applied to OSAP too. That there are documents. I I, I want to emphasize yeah. something I said on my first and only interview. It was a closed program. It operated very similar to a SAP. The director, the director of analysis, and my office chief, and of course, division chief, knew about this program. No one else did. Now, I was also protected by the stovepipe nature of that. 
I did not have to address political type questions. I, I, I was insulated, but they were too. They, there was no one else. People in the surrounding cubicles didn't know. Nothing was purposely being hid. It was a closed stovepipe system, and it needed to be. It needed to be operated that way. What I'm talking about here is documents that have that have risen up in the meantime that are out and out forgeries. Again, I'm not saying why this was done. I'm saying officially, if this was a counterintelligence effort, it probably wasn't a very good one. Uh, but uh, the thing is, is there there's phony material out there, and I uh, we have no reason to do that, and that's why, you know, we were questioned uh, in the review of Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Why did we list all the references? Why? Because we have real references. Whether or not uh, you know people can see that because of all the material that's the proprietary information in those references is, is another situation. But the thing is, is we, li we, we have our references and they're not fabrications, they exist and they exist both in and outside of DIA. So, what I was trying to get to is off that mass during that period you confronted the keepers of the secrets. You were on the trail of what the keepers of the secrets have. The biggest secret in the history of the U.S. government is how we described it in yes. that book. Um, what do we tell? We're not talking about bits and pieces of metal here, are we? You were, your crew, your team, OSAP, was, was on the trail of that stuff, right? I mean, and um, are we wrong about that? Is that counterintelligence? Or did you come to believe that we really do have this stuff? Well, I can tell you, George, that uh, as you know, um, those events in 2011 occurred after the, the OSAP program was shut down. So OSAP was officially sort of stopped in terms of funding being received um, in September of 2010. Uh, by December of 2010, we had a 90-day no-cost extension. And at that stage, the program was over. There was a lot of interaction between different departments and different agencies subsequent to that regarding additional funding. What you are referencing in the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon occurred after the OSAP program officially was terminated. And it, it involved a lot of negotiation and back and forth between different organizations. One of those organizations that we uh, worked with was DHS, as it says in that book, and those, el those elements within DHS did their own version of due diligence. And that's what's being referenced in that book. I, I think what George is getting at is that you guys have already explained that you have gone off you know, after the people that are guarding these secrets that you did find that they're storing this stuff somewhere else. I mean, is that, George, is that your, your point? Is that they've already yeah, said- I think that they, that they believe that those goods exist somewhere hidden in the bowels of defense contractors by the elements of the U.S. government. They think they're real. The period that Colum is describing is when Jim and Colum and some of their colleagues were trying to find a new home for a version of OSAC. Is that correct? That is correct. So on one hand, you're telling me there's disinfo, even within intelligence servers and systems where you can cover up your programs, but you're also telling me UFOs, our government knows, that's why you did all those dirts and that we have them, we've been inside of one of them, you've admitted it now. I don't know that anybody from, a, from the DIA, from your level of the intelligence agency running a UFO program has ever admitted publicly before that we have a UFO and have been inside of it, have been able to get inside of it. That's a big deal, you guys. Well, that still doesn't address George's question. You know, you're not addressing any of George's questions. <laughs> We're not? <laughs> okay. Honey, you're no. dodgy. No. 
Maybe we take a different tack and uh, try to uh, talk about the book in a general term and maybe and try to circle back. Uh, we've, we've mentioned about Arrow a couple of times. Jim, you and Colin have both said in a limited number of interviews that you, you believe that the data warehouse that was established by OSAP, the biggest UFO data warehouse in existence that we know of, that it was now that it was subsequently being put into use by U.S. government agencies. Is Arrow one of those agencies? And if it is, uh, have they reached out to you and Column, or can you say? Like is Arrow using the database that you guys created from OSAP, the, the largest UFO database in history? Jacques Vallée worked a lot with you guys on that. Is Arrow using that? Have they reached out to you about that? On that particular issue, uh, no, they have not. But uh, I know that the uh, originator of, uh, you know, the lead of uh, the UAP task force from whence uh, uh, Arrow evolved did have it. So as for using it, uh, it, it's it's more of a tool to get broad trends. I mean, obviously, my broad trend observation is every car on the road is different if you look at the UFO database. Uh, in other words, models don't. They, if there's if if multiple craft are seen at the same time, yes, they can be duplicates. But in general, everything is different. That's something you use the database for. Also, you know, what do you make of that? What do you make of that in general? I, I'm sorry. I, I, what, I what do you make of that? What, every what do you UFO? make of that? I mean, there there's some indications of what I could say, but I, but I won't say yet. I don't. I think that that's odd. And uh, why is everything dissimilar? You know, you have to. That, that's you have. There are a lot of things that you have to question here. Why uh, did, um, why have, I mean, in, on regard to Skinwalker Ranch, you've seen nothing yet. Nothing. I mean, uh, you, uh, you'd be flabbergasted at some of the occurrences there. And yes, there is documentation for these. Why? What, for, for what purpose? And, and uh, I think it's very dangerous to commit to an answer uh, that someone knows the solution or what's occurring. I think it's... Why, why, why is it so... I, I, I can also, uh, going back to George's question, um, I can answer that also from my perspective. Um, you know, as you know, George, the, the transition um, that occurred between the UAPTF and the various iterations of the U, UAPTF that the, the transition to AOIMSG and then ultimately to AARO um, occurred under completely different uh, leadership and completely different circumstances than the original UAPTF. So um, I, I, was, um, I was interacting with members of the UAPTF on a sort of a consultant informal consultant basis. And I know for a fact that they had access to the, uh, the um, electronic version of the OSAP database. However, the transition that, that occurred in the leadership of the UAPTF was very abrupt, as we know. And the, um, you know, the, the transition that ultimately led to the formation of the AOI MSG um, was very abrupt. And the leadership transferred into the USDI. So once the leadership transferred into the USDI, AOI MSG ultimately became AARO. And under those two um, uh, leaderships of the USDI, I have no personal knowledge that the full OSAP database was used by AOI MSG or by AARO, but I do know it was used by U UAPTF. I think we're, we're dodging a, another bullet here. I was trying to figure out if Arrow had reached out to you guys. Jim indicated that Arrow has not reached out about the database, but they didn't say, he doesn't say whether Arrow has reached out at all. 
I would think there are a few people in the world that have more expertise on this issue than Colm and Jim. And I was just curious, if I were running Aro, I would want to talk to you guys. Have they reached out and tried to just establish a line of communications, or are you able to say? The reach out was on an unclassified network. I would give you the answer, yes, for me. Was it, Dr. was it Dr. Kirkpatrick, you guys, or was it somebody oh, from his office? Oh, now here, Jeremy's getting back to, <laughs> uh, it, it was, it, it was a, a, a person from his office. In a, in okay. a position so, to reach out, I, I, I can say that, that as based on his background and his position, it, it was a proper contact, yes. So, so you guys, the, the, the OSAP program is the, the largest acknowledged UFO program to the, to, to the public, to, to the American public. But we know there were other and are other UFO programs. And we'll get into the are other because on camera, you guys talked with me about that this study continues. We'll get into that. But as far as legacy UFO programs, like what is your understanding of that? Like David Grush talked about it. It's now public that there were these things. Have you ever had experience with that, Jim? Have you been part of a, 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 of a UFO program, a legacy UFO well, program? I, I couldn't say yes or no on that. What I can say is that I am describing that which I was involved with, and that was OSAP. And I have always said, you must do what OSAP did. You've got to, you have no choice but to do all aspects of what OSAP did. Now, you might call it, well, was that fortunate that we did the right things? Well, actually, looking back, yes, it was. I'm kind of surprised we did what you need to do. But any program that is truly looking into UAP paranormal has to do what we did. And what we did, and now I'll put in another thing, or may still be going on. Okay, so, so as far as future uh, looks at the UFO topic, the, you know, OSAP, it ended in the form that we know it. But you have said to me directly and George on camera, we just haven't put that footage out yet, both of you, that the program continues just under a different guise, a different name. So, so that's what yeah, you're saying you're right saying there. You're saying it too. Arrow. Look, look. Uh, I know. No, don't play with me with the arrow yeah. thing. Look There's got to be something else. On, uh, what was it? What is it? Uh, chapter... Uh, Chapter two, the comparison between the two. The only difference between OSAP and what has been mandated by Congress for Arrow is the high cost sensors. We couldn't afford that. Now, we describe in the book, in chapter, in chapter right. uh, what is it, uh, 18, the integrated sensor package. Yes, we had our own design for a sensor package. And there are other other individuals, entities that were interested in placing their own sensor packages with us. Like NASA, like another agency, like who? No, I can't say. Can't say. But okay. there, I mean, now, so, would it have been the same equipment? Well, they may have had resources that we didn't. Ours was a, kind of a, uh, something we could place at multiple locations. Okay, so let me just ask you, both of you can answer this. This is just your opinion. So we know that Project Blue Book ended in 1969, and they, they said nothing to see here, move on. We do not believe that the UFOs pose a national security threat. We now know that that was a lie just because of OSAP, even if you don't admit another legacy program. We know that we were studying UFOs and funding it. Well, let me ask you this. That excuse that was given back in 1969 with the closing of Project Blue Book that they don't believe there's any national security threat. I can't imagine a world where the DIA would be funded for the Defense Warning Office for something like OSEP if they didn't believe that there was a national security threat. So my question is to you, do you believe UFOs represent a national security threat? Well... Lack of knowledge uh, always uh, uh, can. Uh, I mean, directly. A direct threat. Well, is a direct yeah, that's threat what something that you can do something about or not do something about? Or 
there's so many qualifiers to the question and to the answer. It's almost like we're getting into an endless. Um, uh, well, I, I, I can I can step in here because um, that question has been posed to me multiple times. And, you know, threat has two components. One is capability and the second is intent. And we had, we, the OSAP program generated gobs of data on UFO capability. We generated almost nothing on UFO intent. And unless you have both, and I was lectured pretty strongly by one of the, one of the consultants to OSAP, you cannot make the case that um, without, without data on um, intent, you cannot make the case that these uh, objects are a threat to national security. What you can say is that they are a threat to human health. And we, we made that statement in, um, at the end of the OSAP program. We, we generated a fairly large uh, summary of all of the data that pointed in that direction including medical injury cases, including a lot of path pathological cases and physiological cases. And yes, we did say that UFOs are a threat to human health. Are they a, tr a threat to national security? We do not know. We did not accumulate any data um, regarding UFO intent. I'm gonna pull George here. George, so read in their book you know, over the last few days, they talk a lot of, in the book, you guys talk a lot about Colaris in Brazil and how right. for decades that human beings were being physically harmed to the point of death. So at, from UFOs and that their military studied it. Is this like a case? And that also OSAP, you're going to reveal in a future book, did actually do an in-depth investigation about Colaris. So my, my question is, OK, maybe not national security, but in this case, the UFOs, were fucking people up. They were hurting them to the right. point, sometimes to death. So, you, what, so you're, t are you telling me with your book and all this information that UFOs do pose a physical threat a lot of times to people, like in Brazil? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and that's and that's George. one of the reasons that we were trying to complete the database in regard to Brazil, and. Uh, it's simply that that if, if that was occurring here in the U.S., let me tell you, uh, every day you'd see a front page article uh, that did not occur. But, you know, there's there's uh, I don't want to go into something I'm unfamiliar with that is an OSAP in nature. But there's there's current problems now in in in, uh, in uh, South America, you know, and you probably know more about that, Jeremy, about uh uh, what appear to be again threats? Yeah, you, you hear that, but you know it's not as studied yes. as oh, what well, you guys I'm, were able I'm to. Claris you know. and uh, and the surrounding areas, correct? But that so anybody, yeah, anybody that reads your guys' book, just so so our audience knows, basically there's a, a bunch of dedication of, of pages into these bizarre events mm -hmm. in Brazil that were studied by the Brazilian military where these UFOs for decades were harming, murdering, burning, messing up human beings. This is not just like, oh, these great space brothers. This is something that, that was really devastating to these communities and left them in mm -hmm. terror. So I suggest people check yes. that out. I, I would agree with you, Jeremy, and I think um, even beyond the Brazilian cases, I think we accumulated enough uh, cases within the United States to say that, you know, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time um, in terms of proximity to UFOs, in terms of proximity to blue orbs, um, that you can come off the worst. You'll have a lot of symptoms that mimic radiation sickness, for example, um, you know, metallic taste in the mouth, sunburn, um, uh, you, your hair starts falling out. We documented the, these cases. And if you add that to uh, the events in Kolaris, you can make the statement that UFOs are really bad for your mm -hmm. health. I, I would also ask, you know, I think the strength of this new book is the, uh, is the examples that you guys use, that we use to uh, to document and demonstrate 
uh, certain principles, why, why engineering principles, physics principles of how strange this technology is, how yes. advanced it is. One of the cases that comes up is a military case. And I'd remind our listeners that, you know, the Tic Tac case was an OSAP, a bass investigation. It started with OSAP. Uh, later on, iterations of other UFO programs looked into it, but OSAP started that investigation off. And you had another investigation into a military encounter at Lake and Heath. Uh, Colin, can you share with our listeners what the, some of the details about the Lake and Heath case and what stood out that made it interesting to you? Well, I think it was uh, mostly because it was a, again, it was a military uh, uh, situation with our, the RAF Lake and Heath um, got, got a bunch of um, unknown, unknown signals regarding um, something that needed to be checked out. Uh, there were two, two uh, fighter jets that came very, very close and personal with an object that had no aerodynamic surfaces that looked like basically, uh, you know, the raw ingredients of a meteor. Um, it was tracked uh, both on the ground and, and by the, uh, the fighters. And they, they made several passes with this and they had communication, constant communication with ground control. And, you know, the upshot of this thing was that uh, an object was flying. It did not seem to react to their presence. They came up close and personal. They had visual confirmation. They had radar confirmation. You know, in other words, instrumented and sensor confirmation of, of this object. And it was a... Uh, nowhere near as spectacular as the Tic Tac, but it was certainly a, um, an unknown flying object in the vicinity of RF, RAF Lakenheath. And very similar to... And, you know, one of the things that we sort of focused on in the book um, was um, correlating some of, the, um, some of the aspects of UFO performance like lift and propulsion, power generation, spatial temporal translation. And we, we generated a bunch of different cases from the historical literature. And you'll notice a lot of those cases are old cases. So one of the things that, that you know, um, a lot of modern cases are, are thrown up against is, you know, these could be drones. These could be, you know, these could be sort of, um, you name it, either commercial drones or Chinese spy, spy drones or whatever. But, you know, back in the 1950s or 1960s, a lot of these cases are pretty pristine. And, you know, I'm thinking, for example, of the RB47 case that we cite in this book, which is an absolute classic case that uh, Brad Sparks um, investigated and a lot of write-ups, AIAA actually did a write-up on it. And this was a classic case of um, RB-47 craft, aircraft down in uh, Texas, Louisiana area uh, that was flying electronic countermeasures equipment and had this uh, visual sighting, instrumented sighting, radar sightings of, of, of this UFO that essentially outgunned them, outmaneuvered them, and this was all the way back in July of 1957. So you cannot say this was a Chinese high-speed drone. And the level of documentation on that case really is illustrative of, you know, the properties that we cite in the OSAP study regarding lift. Jim Kutlikowski, same sort of question. I know we're sort of, sort of hair-splitting here on the terms of national security threat. But when you have these unknown objects dancing around over our base at Lake and Heath or interacting with the, in the, the area of the Nimitz and the Princeton, flying around with impunity, it may, it's not attacking U.S. cities. It's not using laser beams to wipe out New York or Washington, D.C. So maybe it's not considered a strategic threat, but it certainly has to be considered of interest to our national security interests when it shows such an, uh, an ongoing um, uh, fascination with military facilities, personnel, and equipment. Don't we oh, just yes. Say? But the, the, the thing is, is um, uh, uh, we're, we're investigating them probably properly now. 
it, it's true that the uh, uh, the Lake and Heath uh, incident did not involve um, near collision. Uh, the ones since 2014, 15, perhaps involved more of that, but again, probably not deliberate. So yes, you should be investigating that. It's, it's more or less interference in flight. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want an airliner to uh, have one of these uh, 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 be sucked into the, an engine intake. Uh, they're, they're rather large. Um, relatively speaking. So, uh, yes, it should be in, uh, investigated, and that's why I believe Arrow exists right now, is that's a starting point. Um, as for investigating many of these civilian cases, it needs to be done. Uh, does it need to be done by the government? I believe the contractors are fully capable, but there needs to be uh, certainly a database that needs to be upkept and also constructed properly. I, I, I think Colum hasn't mentioned this yet, but uh, we do mention in, in this book, more than mention, it's a couple chapters, the Valley Davis system of categorizing. You know, you can have a database and, it, and it's just a bunch of data. Unless it's categorized properly and be able to be searched on, then um, uh, then you can see trends, and that's what uh, that's what we did with uh, uh, the Capella database, the Capella Bass database. So yes, it's huge, but it's it is searchable. I I want to read something from your book. So when you talk about future work in your book, you make eight suggestions, a couple of which are establish a data facility liaison. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for operations, collect and analyze uncorrelated target data, which would be from like NORAD, yes. right? This is something that a friend of mine in George is a journalist named Chris Sharp has really dug into, which is he's getting information from them. Well, we don't keep any UFO data. We do keep uncorrelated target data, though. Where do they put that? So you would like to see all that come in, be able to analyze what they call uncorrelated yes. data, which is things that do propel through the sky with intention, but we don't, we can't correlate it to our own craft. So you'd like to see that data come in in future yes. studies. But one thing you said, it would, when you guys gave the eight different suggestions for future work, you talk about collection of oral and written histories. Now, let me just read you what you wrote, two sentences. It says, collect under appropriate security caveats, oral and written histories <laughs> from individuals with firsthand exposure to apparent exotic technologies and or circumstances surrounding the same. This would include seeking out and contacting military and civilian personnel, scientists and engineers and companies that may mm -hmm. already have had access to firsthand data concerning novel technologies. So in writing that, you got to know that there are corporations, companies, military individuals who have direct firsthand experience in this exploitation program or programs well, yes about UFOs. And no, but you're reading something exactly that was in the um, uh, both proposal and which I don't think will ever be released, the proposal from Bass and also the program pr planning documents for the startup of OSAP. That's direct wording from that. That was a hope that we could do that. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I in other words, I wouldn't put too much. A, well, that's a. Uh, that's a statement based upon knowledge, but a statement based upon desire. In other words, that those. Those are exact words from the document. But I, I should say, you know, since uh, SATP Skinwalkers of the Pentagon was a compilation document. It was written. Uh, on our new book, we tried to keep, with editing, of course, we needed to edit, or edit the grammar and the spelling. We, we tried to keep as close to the original language that was in our documentation that DIA received. And the reason for that is I, I want the, the, your listeners and the readers of this document to understand 
they're in the same management shoes or position that we were. This is the document that really came in. So I wouldn't put too much into the statement you, you read because it was used as a plan. And as I said, these plans ne never came to fruition, mainly because one, the core items were completed in the two years, and two, it, it would have required more money and more personnel to do them. Okay. And, and, and time. Fine, 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 fine. But Jim, like, do you think the American public deserves to know about the ultimate reality, the fact that there are appear to be non-human intelligence flying spacecraft or something that looks like yes, them. That's why we're doing, the, we're, we're doing these books. We're trying. So you believe the American public has a, a right to know? Within the security limits. Within security limits. Security comes first. But the thing is, is national security comes first. But that's why we're assembling these books and we're trying to accurately assemble them based on real references that may or may not be available to the public. But you're getting direct ac extracts from these these references. No, it's it's great. I just wanted to see where you stand on that UAP transparency or not. I mean, we got to crack the saying, egg. At some am I a disclosure no. advocate? The answer is no. What's the difference in your the mind? The difference is security. You know, there's certain things. Oh, and, and now now if, if, if this involves security plus, because having come from the contractor world in the, in the first half of my career, I can say if there's heavy investment of contractor capital, their overhead money into technologies, and they've been given these technologies, they're going to hang on to them. It's just like, hey, wait a minute, uh, we've invested a lot of our personal resources into research. And that can apply to every topic. It's going to be difficult to pry loose technology when something's been given over and a private company has invested their money, their stockholders' money, into research. So that's an entirely different aspect, but ours is security. We're trying to release information. Yeah, but, but does it, doesn't it drive you crazy? I mean, I get it, there's security. I get it that private companies were given something, have invested a lot of money, but isn't this topic kind of bigger than these issues, that, those two issues, the fact that we're, we might not be alone? Well, yes, but I think that we can convey that through the proper method, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so you are trying to convey that in the proper, to the American public. In the public. proper way. I'm not, I'm not going okay. out there and, 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 uh, and interviewing with uh, everybody uh, to say what I really feel. Uh, no, it was hard to get you to do yeah. this. I mean, I can testify you're not doing no, it in an you improper can understand way. Why people hang up on me when I say, you can offer me all of this. But I'm not going to say anything more than what's been approved. So let me get back to George here. So George, what are you thinking? Are we cracking the egg here with, with Jim and Colin? Oh, not even coming, not coming close. Uh, let, let's put it this, here's another tack we could take. Jim, uh, Dr. Lukowski, uh, you know, I, I believe that you have made it clear that you were uh, in contact with Congress. Uh, I know that you were asked about testifying and you declined. Do you feel that telling Congress all of what you know um, would constitute a possible threat? That, uh, you know, a mutual friend of ours, of uh, uh, mine and yours and, and Columns, has said it many times, you can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. Well, do you think that uh, telling Congress the lowdown on things that you really know but can't say here would, would represent a likely threat that that would be that information would be linked to our adversaries and enemies. That's my personal belief. I mean, there's two things I said, and that's in response to your mention of Congress contacting me. One, and I repeated this to multiple folks, I don't want to get involved in what would appear to be a three-ring circus right now. It's, it's just... 
it's too much for me. That's why I'm devoting. And I don't want, I don't get involved in answering things in Twitter, which I easily could, or Reddit, which I easily could. I want it to be documented in these DOD approved books. That's my method of saying what I have to say. Do I have a lot more that I could say and that will be seen uh, uh, perhaps if it's approved? Yes. I, I mean, I, I can tell you with skinwalkers at the Pentagon, they had a number of comments that I felt were really legitimate security observations um, that it needed to be changed. But did the story still come through? Absolutely, yes. I mean, what, what's the old saying? There's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, whatever that means. But there's, there's yeah. just a, 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 there are multiple ways of doing it. And we're trying to, Colm and I and George are trying to, now George is good at pushing and so are you. You know, push the limits, push the limits. Well, we can write whatever we want, but if it doesn't get by, by Dopser, DOD, review, then, you know, we're, we're kind of wasting our time. I think we, we know what are our, our red lines not to cross. And going to Congress would be a red line to me personally, because I, I talk too much. I say too much, but I purposely cut it off right here. I just... Well, what if you what if you were subpoenaed, though? I mean, you know, they're trying to do yeah. that in Congress. They're trying to subpoena well, people and say, hey, Dr. Le- Dr. Le- you know, you've These worked on rumors about Dr. I'm just OK, but hold on. If you're subpoenaed and asked to tell the, and asked to tell the truth, you're under oath. First of all, right. Let's, let's, Would you let's tell the truth? The old phrase, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay, George, I'm, I'm laughing so hard right now, George. I wish you were on video. So, George, I was thinking, um, do you have a, I, I want to bring Colm into something that was written in the book. It, it sounds like something Colm has tried to answer for me before. It's about the nature of the phenomenon itself. So let me read that, George, from the book. Cool. Um, okay, guys. So when we're talking about what we know about UFOs, George and I have talked about this a bunch. What do we know? Okay. We know that UFOs represent a... a huge amount of energy in a small amount of space. That's, that's been proven. However, what do we really know? And you guys have something in your book that is just, it's just a couple sentences or one sentence. It was so profound to me. And I want to hear you guys elaborate on it. It says, everything works as if UAP were the product of a technology that, inter- that integrates physical and psychic phenomenon and primarily affects cultural variables in our society through the manipulation of psychological and physiological parameters in the witness, in the witnesses. Can you guys expand? That's a huge statement. Can you expand on that? Well, I know that a lot of that, um, that statement, um, comes at least from my personal experience with, spending hundreds of days on Skinwalker Ranch. And um, as we've gone uh, over before, you know, Skinwalker Ranch had both nuts and bolts uh, objects, shiny metallic objects. It also had a plethora of very unusual phenomena. Um, There was a lot of evidence that was gathered um, and uh, some that I saw personally involving the manipulation of perception. And so there is a a lot of really good work and really good documentation regarding the manipulation of perception by people like Jacques Vallée. Um, You know, even Whitley Strieber has written in his latest book, there is a, a lot to do with manipulation of perception. So a technology that is both influential in terms of you know, leaving an imprint on the ground that you can extrapolate that this thing weighed two and a half tons to altering people's psychic makeup, um, there's really no contradiction there. I mean, you've got to be able to harness and work with ambiguity if you're working with the UFO topic at all, because putting them into one box, 
you know, the nuts and bolts box or only the psychic box just doesn't work. You've got to, uh, you've got to balance the, the idea that a technology can manipulate human perception and even from a long-term perspective, manipulate human cultural phenomena as well as, you know, operate as a machine. So you've got to you've got to hold those two balls in the air. And if you're not capable of doing that, you should not be looking at UFOs. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of people have filed FOIA requests, uh, you know, based on skinwalkers at the Pentagon. We, we listed all those reports that were produced by OSAP and Bass. And, you right. know, there's some great stuff, as we know. Um, but, you know, people write to um, the DIA and the responses they get is we don't have it. Well, there is no such report. For example, there's an analysis that is referenced in skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Um, about an, uh, an analysis of Tic Tac, for example, that case and, uh, and a few others, um, DIA's answer is, uh, we don't have it. Uh, it doesn't exist. Um, do you suspect that those documents will ever be made public? Dr. Well, Likaski? that particular one, as you probably already know, um, uh, was a complete document uh, uh, analyzing uh, a Tic Tac object and a spherical object and it was done based on bass capabilities at the time. Uh, it actually is, um, well, the way it was written was it had that plus a uh, uh, background material on the Tic Tac. Uh, and I, I would say that there was information in there that was personal information, not proprietary information. We were using commercial software. Uh, will that document ever be released? I don't know. Uh, uh, we can do pieces of it in a future book, but the analysis tool that was being used was state of the art at the time, and you need the color aspect of it. Well, as probably your listeners and readers know, color is kind of expensive in any book, especially uh, books that are reaching the size that we're we're doing. So, will it reach? They have the document. Whether they've destroyed it, uh, uh, how do you destroy an electronic document? That's unclear. Uh, whether they would be willing to go through uh, 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 removing the personal information, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I, 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 the, the wording is probably wrong that the document doesn't exist. Yes, it does. I mean, you had it in your hand. Uh, but the thing is, is as for uh, uh, the public ever seeing the full document, again, there's the color problem. Well, hold on, hold on. So, George, he just said, oh, does the document exist, meaning 140-plus mm -hmm. page analysis of the Tic Tac UFO that the world has never seen, generated by the DIA. And a spherical object. Yeah, generated by – and a spherical object, generated by the DIA. Um, you know, famously, George would have loved to have given yes. that, you know, as a submission to Congress, famously. But uh, the, the thing is, is Jim, Jim Lukowski just said, George, you had that in your hands. It exists. So if the DIA is telling us some document doesn't exist, but you had it in your hands, George, what does that mean for the fate of the document? Couldn't that just go out to the public then if they don't admit it exists? No, there's the there's the there's the problem of, of, of uh, having that the personal information in there. Someone has to scrub it. It is DIA's job. George, you'd be willing to scrub it. Oh, uh, no, that's not. <laughs> George, 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 okay, go, go. that was a rhetorical question, Jim. So, George, just tell us what your thoughts are here. Well, I, I could not, it's not my document to release, and I wouldn't uh, release it um, without permission from uh, the people that uh, allowed me to see it. Uh, so I, I just couldn't do that because if I were to do that, I would never get access to documents again. Um, of that nature, so I, I can't do it, but I'd be happy to do it if uh, if somebody gave me the green light. Yeah, if people weren't going to have problems. Well, so so, Colin, back to the, this basic thing. 
you've tried to talk with me before about the physical and the psychic nature of UFOs. And you're saying, look, you got to be prepared for both if you're going to investigate this. But that statement that you guys wrote in your book, it really is something I think people really need to pay attention to. You're saying that everything works as if UAP were the product of a technology that integrates physical and psychic phenomena. But then you say, and primarily affects cultural variables in our society through manipulation of psychological and physiological parameters. What do you mean manipulate cultural uh, variables? I'm sorry, I'm obsessed with this quote. Well, do you want to take that, Jim? Because I've already answered it. (laughs) Well, uh, we see... Cultural variables. Don't we see that occurring right now? What do you mean? No, Your answer no, to the question about me. Don't we see me. that? Uh, uh, basically, uh, there's a. Um, well, I got a, I got something to to really reference, and it'll it'll be a, another little bombshell of mine. We had, but you're going to answer had, my yes, question without a question. What is the purpose of the Men in Black? We. That is we, a question. We have encountered the Men in Black. The legitimate ones. You the have. legitimate ones. You have. I didn't say me, but the answer the answer is Who, yes. What do you mean the legitimate uh, there men in black? Are people what is this who are, are, are gaming gaming knowledge of the men in black. But what is the purpose of the men in black? Is it to draw attention away from the UFO phenomenon? Are using reverse psychology, draw attention to it and the paranormal, of course. What is the purpose? It could be, exa- there are polar opposites, the answers. That's always been the men in black dissuade. Do they, knowing human psychology, do they or do they do exactly the opposite? They draw attention to the phenomenon. And that's what I mean. In my answer to you, I wanted to use an example of manipulating cultural variables that they're drawing attention. Hey, this really exists. Now, you can also go off on the side a little bit is say, are we in the realm? Because I've been I've talked to multiple people about this. Are we in the realm of what we would consider demonic influence? Have we crossed into that? That's a cultural variable too. Operating at the same level, we, we've got to consider all this. That's why I think this is such a wonderful topic because you've got all these things you still have to consider. And the, you know, it's now I'm gonna be long gone and Colin probably will be long gone and you'll be long gone and they'll still be exploring all this and not have all the answers, but that's, that's the manipulation from my point of view of, hey, get interested in this stuff. It's real. And don't just jokingly, you know, like the term dino beavers, you know, uh, 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 that uh, Juliet and, and Colum saw a dino beaver. No one said anything. That's just created to make a joke about, about uh, our efforts. But this is a real phenomenon, accepted as such, and you'll see that that was part of what DIA did. Collect data, collect data, collect data. The intel communities are great at doing that. But that's an answer to your question, and there's so many aspects uh, of cultural manipulation, and I think it's positive manipulation. Uh, 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 Using, an, again, an old expression, the train has left the station. No, it hasn't. These books are proof. Of it. No, people can still get on the train, but those who laugh and joke don't bother getting on the train because, you know, you just, <laughs> you're not learning anything from the experience. So, George... Dr. Lukowski just gave us a good answer, but I, I did notice when he was telling us that he said something about the real men in black and that he's actually met him or something. Can, can you just, I, we can't let that go. You have to, now you that you have said to that. let it go. You have to let it go. <laughs> but now the false men in black. Now, uh, uh, there was an incident, and I'm not going to go into the incident, but Colm is aware of this. There was an incident of a false men in black. 
and let's assume they were working for some government agency. What they've never known and never has been revealed is the person they were interview obtained a gun. He was so afraid of them, he was ready to shoot it out. If they made the wrong move, it would have been a disaster. It would have come back on us in some way, I'm sure, because uh, I, I was asked in an interview once, uh, what was your greatest fear during OSUP? And it was like, it's tomorrow and the next day because there was always something that was happening that would come back and we had to fix. But we've never revealed that, that he, this person was so afraid of the false men in black that he had a gun tucked into his uh, waistband under his sweatshirt. Were you guys the false no, men in no, black we just like no, going we, and doing we were, we were, it was another government no, agency? No, no, we, we were, we followed all the rules. We don't know. We, we, you, know we, you don't know who it no, was? You can, you can trace back so far, but you can't. Uh, if it was a counter intel operation by some organization, then it would have could have, I mean, that was a bad decision on their part. Bad. They shouldn't have pushed this fella to that point where he was ready to resort to violence in defense. And he was in his own home being potentially threatened. Well, I, you know, I think there's a long history also of, especially back in the 60s and 70s, I think everybody is aware of this, of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, um, <clears throat> having people um, out there um, trying to dissuade witnesses from talking to the media, um, threatening them. Um, in, I think in the 50s and 60s, threats were much more overt than they would be now. But I think there's this, this multiple arenas of men in black, um, all of which are sort of mutually supportive in driving paranoia um, in uh, witnesses and in the field in general. Um, and a lot of these are multiple agendas for different reasons. And uh, some of them are mimicking uh, the real men in black. Some of them are the real men in black. It's a, um, I think it's one of these, I would class it as another example of what I call bi-directional mimicry. Okay, but the real men in black, are, are we talking about humans or non-human intelligence? So what is the real men in black compared to just government agents being, you know, interrogating people? I think there's enough evidence in the literature to indicate that the, um, the phenomenon may be associated with some cases of what we call men in black. But what are they? Well, there are parts of the phenomenon. Okay. So not just government agents walking around. Well, there's government agents that are also um, at the same time in parallel working on, um, you know, on intimidating witnesses. I know, but I'm not talking about the government agents. I'm talking about what you're calling the real men in black. So you're like, there yeah, is I'm, a I'm saying that they're part of the phenomenon. OK, I think there's enough. I think there's enough data in the literature, especially if you go back all the way to the 1950s. Um, to corroborate that statement. Even in the 1800s, there, were, there was a phenomenon like that. If you read uh, John Kill's uh, Trojan Horse, Operation Trojan Horse, there's in the 1800s, right. there's a version of the men in black. Well, George, I am highly frustrated as always when I talk with Dr. Kelleher and Dr. Lukatsky. So what do you think, George? Where, where does this go from here? Well, there's a lot of great stuff in this book. I mean, you know, part of the a lot of criticism that came at us from skinwalkers at the Pentagon is too much woo. It's just too weird. And I always thought, you know, uh, I was proud of what we did with that. And, and because it followed the evidence where it led. Uh, and and uh, the people who were involved with OSAP, with BAST, and, and some of their allies uh, looked at this without self-censorship. They didn't decide hey, this is an interesting UFO case, but it's got this weird poltergeist angle, so we're going to toss that out. They had the courage to include it because it was necessary to, to look at the big picture. Um, and, and that was where we started with the skinwalkers at the Pentagon. This book narrows down the focus. People have complained and griped and bitched and moaned that they want data. Here's some data. Here's the principles that are laid out in those dirts that started off the OSAP program, that the baseline 
uh, projections of what we know now and what we hope will happen 50 years down the road. And then it has examples, real life examples, solid UFO cases from government files that were investigated and that remain really perplexing. That uh, And each of those cases, uh, Jim and Colm have, have, have really deftly used to demonstrate a particular engineering principle, a physics principle, indicating that these things are real, that they are beyond our capabilities, that we're certainly way beyond our capabilities when they happen, and that there's a genuine mystery here. And it, it is, again, I think in very great detail, demonstrates why this is a legitimate topic for investigation, uh, that there's real things uh, to consider, that there's physics and engineering, nuts and bolts, and case after case that, that demonstrates um, that this is a legitimate uh, inquiry. That's my take on it. Very good. Totally yeah. agree, George. I guess we're on the right track, George. We're getting a double thumbs up here. Um, Look, guys, I, I really appreciate it. I think if I take – I have to kind of think about the people watching or listening to this. If I could take one thing away other than reading your book, which I suggest people do, but if I could take one thing away that really struck me, it is the first time in history, I think, that we have somebody of, of your uh, – Dr. Lukatsky, of, of your kind of depth within the intelligence agency, the defense intelligence agency, and within the UFO program that you ran for the defense intelligence agency – that stated, and I quote, the United States was in possession of a craft of unknown origin and had successfully gained access to its interior. Interior. So you personally know about a UFO that we got access inside of. I have to assume, Dr. Lukatsky, that you've seen this bad boy. You don't got to answer me, but I'm going to make that assumption unless you tell me otherwise. Um you also say that this craft had a streamlined configuration s suitable for aerodynamic flight, but no intakes, exhaust wings, or control surfaces. So if I had to take something away from all this, you just made the admission that our government is reverse engineering. If we got inside of it, we're reverse engineering UFOs. You see, I'm not speaking at all. I mean, I'm not going beyond what, it was, what you read from the book. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I do appreciate that, that you did put that uh, in the book. Look, we have Dr. Eric Davis in the New York Times saying craft, a, you know, uh, not made here on Earth. There are individuals like you who have come out and pushed the envelope a little bit. And I thank you for that. Even if you can't sp speak further from the book, that is a huge admission. I mean, that'll be the title of the YouTube video. I mean, that's a huge admission. What do you think, George? I I'd also say this, is that I know that people in UFO world will be listening to this pulling their hair out because Jim is very careful in what he says. But the fact is that that is why, that is a big reason why he's been trusted with this information to start with, that he doesn't go blabbing and, and talk and reveal things that he's not supposed to talk about. And that's why I suspect he will continue to be trusted um, uh, by our government. And, and hopefully there's going to be a a future investigation or maybe one underway right now that he would be allowed to know about. I, I know it, it does get frustrating that we have to hair split and uh, dance around certain of these cases and incidents and, and information, but, you know, that's part of, of who he is and why he got that job, you know? So uh, it's, it's great always to talk with Jim on or off the record and with Colm, of course, they've helped me understand this big white world so much and even though they've shared things with me that I can't say publicly, it has helped me so much in understanding who else is completely full of crap out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thank you guys so much. I mean, um, you know, I think that with the limited things you can say, people should read your book and start to understand a little bit more about what OSAP did and, and how it did it, what the thought process was. I do appreciate that. And, and for for you know, just coming on the show and, and for help guiding, as George said, you know, what, what he knows is sometimes BS just from kind of getting to understand where you guys are coming from. So thank you for all this. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. Follow and listen to Weaponized, a presentation of Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, Dark Horse Entertainment, and Cadence 13 Studios. Available now for free on the Odyssey app 
or wherever you get your shows.